Uh, Mr. Nakhshon, I want to ask you, we uh, hear Amir Oren said that with the lack of diplomacy, you can put all the forces on the ground that you want. You can conduct security measures. You can, I'm sorry, Mr. Navon, I'm sorry. Uh, I. Uh, I was uh, mistaken. But uh, you can put whatever you want on the ground. You can put all the soldiers or security forces, but when you don't have on the other side also diplomacy, and when you don't have some kind of a peace plan or a path towards peace, it seems that these attacks will continue forward. They will continue in both cases. Historically, it's a fact. I just want to remind you that the, the first stabbing that started about three months ago most of the stabbers posted on their Facebook page before they committed their terrorist attacks, what motivated them. None of them mentioned the lack of peace process or the lack of political horizon. They spoke in terms of religion and they claimed that they were, they were, they were uh, doing a religious uh, act uh, to, to revenge what they called the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, on which the Jews were walking and uh, with their dirty feet, etc., etc. Now, as Amir Oren himself just said, at the very height of the peace process in the past, there were terrorist attacks. Now, it doesn't mean that there should not be a peace process, but let us not fool ourselves about the connection between the two. And I also want to remind you, uh, I think this morning, uh, there was in the uh, Time of Israel, uh, an article in which Mahmoud Abbas admitted that he rejected the peace offer of Eud Olmert in 2008, which included a complete withdrawal from the West Bank and Gaza, a gesture on uh, the refugees, uh, the, the sharing of sovereignty over the Temple Mount. So, and, and, you know, and it was rejected. So yeah, it would be preferable to have a peace process, but uh, A, the fact that Israel made offers in the past that were very serious offers that were rejected systematically by the Palestinian leadership yeah, is a he fact. He mentioned that there was a reason for that. I mean, you cannot just ignore he mentioned why, the right of return. The You're right. No, not the right of return. He by did. The way. He did. He did. He mentioned also the right of return. He said he has no right to uh, to, for, to forego the right of return for five million Palestinians. And as we know, the right of the so-called right of return, which has absolutely no basis in international law, is incompatible with a two-state solution. He mentioned it in, in his interview yesterday. He also mentioned it in 2009 in his interview with Jackson Dill in the Washington Post. So he's saying it. I'm not saying that it for him. The I'm sorry the problem to say was, that I, The I, problem was Olmert's right of return to the prime ministership, yeah, which exactly. was not on the table. But, yes, I, I, know, I know that this is a theory. No, I'm once. sure, but the fact that he's saying him himself that he did not reject the offer because Olmert was a lame duck. He's not saying it. He said that it was because of a couple of reasons. First of all, more than anything else, is that they refused to give him the map, meaning that he needed to say yes for a map that he couldn't know, discuss. He had the figures, and the figures were it was 5.8 of annexation and compensation in Israel. Basically, it was 99.5 percent of the West Bank with land swaps. And these and five figures. Five days later, Olmert resigned. Not five days later, because the first order later, was in May 16, 2008. No, no, no. 16 of but September. But again, you're it trying was to find excuses to for. He, he, he Resign. Fine, but you're trying to find excuses where he himself is not using those excuses. Uh, you, want to, uh, you want to answer? Yeah, uh, I can only add, you know, th well, this is not the reason, of course. We all understand that, you know, if Abbas rejected or not rejected, this is not the reason for what we see today. I think that part of the reason is that there's no hope on the other side. There's complete despair on the other side. When you talk to the Palestinians, they understand that they have two ways, either to accept the occupation or to fight and to go and to kill Jews. Now, I'm not justifying anything, of course, but you cannot just ignore and say this is only because they want to, to kill Jews. The writing was on the wall for more than a year. People threatened, people said that this will come. And more than that, the security apparatus in Israel itself was the one that told the prime minister, that told the minister of defense, this is about to come, this is about to happen if we will not going to see some kind of a political horizon. It might be uh, futile to rehash even recent history for the last uh, six years, ever since Netanyahu came back into power, he stopped the Annapolis process, uh, which um, went on during the Olmert and Tsipi Livni period. And then all the uh, efforts um, uh, were um, uh, invested by the Obama administration in trying to restart the process. But having said that, only a week ago, the Israeli government uh, prematurely uh, was delighted to announce that um, the tactic of uh, house demolition is, is apparently working because someone uh, told the authorities that he um, the tactic of uh, house demolition 
is, is apparently working because someone uh, told the authorities that his son perpetrated one of the murders, which, by the way, is unheard of for a security service to point at the source, and who knows what will happen to this father later. But it turns out that there is no deterrence. These two murderers uh, this afternoon knew full well that their houses or their family houses could very well uh, be demolished. It didn't deter them. I just want uh, to give uh, the reaction from the Prime Minister's uh, office uh, today uh, in uh, reaction to today's deadly terror attacks. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu once again reiterated that terror in Israel is uh, no different than terror in Paris or elsewhere in the world. He uh, described those unwilling to condemn attacks on Israelis as blind hypocrites. Um, I want to ask, you know, I'm trying to understand what is happening here. Just a few days ago, just two days ago, uh, uh, the foreign minister of Sweden uh, just uh, said what she said about uh, trying to connect or not connecting between the, uh, connecting between the, Israel, the, the terror attacks in Paris and the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. Yet what we're seeing right now is that also the prime minister is connecting between the two. He's saying if you are condemning the terror attacks in Paris, you need to condemn also the terror attacks in uh, the Palestinian, uh, in, in Israel here and what is uh, being uh, done to the Israelis. And I'm asking myself, so why Israel is angry on Sweden when it's doing the same thing and asking from the world to do the same thing? Because it is not his He's not doing the same thing. I'm not here to defend the prime minister, but he's not doing the same thing. He's not making the same kind of connection. What the Swedish uh, foreign minister was uh, trying to say was to rationalize and even to justify those kind of terrorist attacks. And what we we're saying before, it's lack of political horizons, desperation. Even in Europe, you, see, you hear those kind of voices. You know, why do you have people coming into, a, uh, 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 in, into Paris killing hundreds? Well, because of desperation. They must be upset about something. So as soon as you rationalize those completely irrational and hateful crimes, uh, then there's always a reason. So you can rationalize, you know, in the case of Israel, it's because there's no political horizon. And I'm not saying this in order to justify the lack of horizon, but also in Europe. Some people say, well, it's because of uh, colonialism in the past, it's because of what's happening between Israel and the Palestinians. In other words, they're also sometimes they're trying to rationalize it, and some say no. It comes from an insane ideology, a certain interpretation of religion, and has nothing to do uh, with this or that uh, uh, desperation from today or from yesterday. I just uh, want uh, to join to this uh, conversa conversation. Peter Hume, a freelance journalist in uh, Paris, uh, live uh, from Paris. Uh, Peter, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us. So uh, what are the latest updates from you? Well, the very latest uh, update is that the uh, French uh, police uh, and other uh, security forces are continuing their sweep uh, across uh, France. There have been uh, latest uh, activities. They've staged uh, several raids in Olny, uh, which is uh, yet another suburb of uh, Paris, this time uh, slightly more to, uh, to the uh, east from Saint-Denis, where the shootout uh, occurred uh, yes, early yesterday morning. In the course of today's operation, they've uh, arrested uh, or he holding for interrogation and questioning at least 70 more suspects. Now, this afternoon, shortly after 3 p.m. Paris time, the Interior Ministry did confirm that uh, Abdel Hamid Abaoud, who'd been considered to be the mastermind behind Friday night's bloody attacks here in Paris, uh, was amongst those killed in that police raid at Saint-Denis to the north of Paris very early yesterday morning. Uh, he was identified by the use of uh, fingerprints. The uh, Interior Ministry says that uh, they received some help from a non-European intelligence service, which we understand to be the Moroccan secret service, who are able to track uh, Abaoud, who was, uh, even though he was a Belgian citizen, his parents had uh, emigrated from Morocco some 40 years ago. So the Moroccan uh, intelligence service is being of uh, some help to, to the French. Otherwise, the uh, security sweeps will continue. T tomorrow we will see the upper house of parliament, the Senate, uh, approving the uh, state of emergency, extending that state of emergency for another three months uh, to towards the end of February. Now that allows the police a great much freer hand uh, to move around and to uh, in investigate go into houses without a warrant uh, and also will potentially uh, crack down on firebrand uh, imams and uh, any other associations that uh, are believed to be anti-French, anti the Republic, and that would certainly...
potentially <laughs> pose a threat to the public at large. So, uh, uh, Peter? one other fact I think I uh, w want to mention. It, yes. Yes, I, I just want to Go ask ahead. you the fact that the police officers will be uh, will have uh, on their body uh, weapon even in their free time, even when they are not uh, in, uh, when they are not do, uh, in duty, what does it mean for the French people? Because this is, you know, unprecedented. Uh, seeing the French people maybe having the same normal life, let's say, like the Israelis, is something, is a really big change of state of mind of the French people. Yes, that's right. Uh, that's, as, as you mentioned, one of the uh, provisions of the state of emergency would be now, in fact, that the police will be able to bring uh, their weapons uh, back home, I guess, once they're off duty, uh, ready at a, uh, at a moment's notice to, uh, to spring back into action if, if the need arises. Now, I think uh, in, in Paris uh, and throughout France, we're going to see a certain curtailment of uh, the kind of liberties or uh, the amount of freedom of movement there will be more checks that uh, you know that Parisians are going to have to and French uh, people at large are probably going to have to sacrifice a little bit of their uh, a little bit of their traditional freedoms uh, but I think the the, the government's uh, moves are fully supported by the uh, the public at large we uh, no one here I think wants to see obviously any kind of repetition and the yes. focus now is on making sure that doesn't happen again and I think the French are, go are going to accept whatever uh, measures will be introduced yes. as, uh, you know, and they look as if they're going to be fairly tough measures. Yes, uh, Peter Hume, thank you very much uh, for this uh, update uh, from you. Uh, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu is calling hypocrisy someone who is ignoring uh, what happened in Paris and what what is happening here in Israel. And I'm asking, isn't it naive from Israel to actually ask the people in Europe to try and condemn what is happening in Israel or try to start understanding what is happening in Israel with the Palestinians? Well, terrorism is just uh, a method. Terrorism is not the thing in itself. The um, uh, Daesh people, as well as Palestinians and others, use terror when they don't have other means. If Daesh has rockets or if it has chemical weapons, they will use those too. And the question is, what is the political motive behind the uh, terror uh, acts? Uh, with Daesh, there is no compromise. There is no plan, there is no national goal that you can talk about and perhaps uh, reach a compromise if there is common ground. With the Palestinians, there could be, some of the Palestinians, there could be a compromise. With Hamas, for instance, there is no possibility of reaching a grand compromise, only a sort of a hudna, of an armistice, because their declared aim is to have a Muslim um, uh, state instead of, of the state of Israel. But in this, in this specific uh, issue, uh, Avi, I want to ask you, when Israel is sending double messages uh, to... Um, uh, state, instead of, of the state of Israel. But in this, in this specific uh, issue, uh, Avi, I want to ask you, when Israel is sending double messages uh, to uh, the people in uh, Israel, or maybe to the Palestinians, from after you, one year after Operation Protective Edge, Israel, we're hearing some uh, reports saying that Israel is conducting some kind of talks with Hamas. The Palestinians who are seeing this in the West Bank are saying, well, maybe Israel understands only power because if they fired rockets at Israel and Israel is actually one year after sitting down with them and trying to get some understanding, what are we getting from this, the people in the West Bank? The answer is nothing. I mean, Palestinians in the West Bank, especially when we are talking about the Palestinian Authority, is getting nothing from the Israeli side. There was some talks, there was some gestures. The population lives in a better conditions than the, the Gazans ones, but at the end of the day, I think that we, we, we saw it. We saw it coming, and I think that I was here so many times yeah. saying it. If you would hear the Shin Bet officers, if you would hear the, the intelligence officers, they were all saying that again and again and again. It's going to happen, it's going to come. For the government, it was pretty convenient to ignore everything. And now it seems that the government is completely stuck upon, look, the terrorism, we cannot do anything. Now, when there's no terrorism, say, why to hurry? Why, what's the rush? We, can, we need to wait and to see what will happen in the Middle East. So we're kind of a dead-end situation. And when I look at the horizon, when I look at the future, 
there's only black over there. There's nothing positive. There's no horizon. There's no some kind of a solution or strategic thought in the Israeli side about what should we do about this terrorism. Look, then again, today in Hebron, I must say, I saw more soldiers than Palestinians. I saw so many soldiers, and still we see that there are some attacks. So what is the solution here? I, look, I don't disagree on the fact that it would be preferable to have a horizon. But the problem is, you talked about a dead-end situation. I would more describe it as a catch-22 situation. Because, again, what is Israel supposed to do? I mean, renew the negotiations again that have been going on for like 22 years with the, with the PLO, with Hamas, uh, put on the table again the proposal that uh, it would armor. All I'm saying is that it's not that there have not been negotiations in the past, and it's not that they haven't led to a dead end. So I'm saying, yes, it would be preferable, but what do you suggest? I mean, that, that's the real question. It is a catch-22 situation. By the way, Israel also tried the unilateral move in Gaza because it was despairing of the Palestinian leadership. And that's why also Sharon said, you know what, we'll just pull out throw the keys, and we saw the results. So that's why I'm talking about a catch-22 situation. It's a very complex situation. And just saying, oh, well, you know, you should do something, and there should be a horizon, it's easy to say, but it's much harder to do. Yeah, just, uh, I want, what is your reaction about uh, Israel being uh, naive, maybe, about uh, asking from Europe to understand it? Look, I don't expect anything from anybody. You know, I believe in the word realpolitik, and I don't expect the Europeans to, uh, to behave uh, any other way. Uh, so I think that uh, each country behaves according to their interests and not according to their uh, feelings. Things, and I personally don't expect anything from the Europeans. Yes, uh, just before uh, we're continuing, the alleged uh, mastermind of the Paris terror attacks, Abdel Hamid Abaoud, is dead, killed by French special forces during yesterday's police raid in the Saint Denis suburb. The re revelation uh, comes as uh, France's uh, prime minister warned that the Islamic State could use chemical or biological weapon against the country. I 24 News correspondent Or Shapira recaps the day's event.